Mathematics sum up the Skull Street streetlights, an inkwell for verbatim unraveling, the palette for a hip-hop writer, a creator composing understanding words of culture brilliance, powering a rebalance of the elements equally. Audio these pages of rejuvenated reaffirmation, simply the almighty leadership of insightful craft work that stands to build to any conversation born to be. And now the daily duty use, is using ears for the good to filter the real. And as the art decays by dilution, he concentrates the best again and again, exposing it in the pod. S Street, the evolution of media, where every intrigue will have its own show, every incredible thought will have its own episode, and every timeless insight will be archived. Today I am the journalist, tomorrow your historian. Here are some sword scrolls swung on a special broadcast. Leading off, this is your brother, the lone low life with the home sewn garment, the boricua with the build, the true and living God stepping in score. Soon he has a lot, AKA skill straight low. And this is a Power Right Show special, a very special one that was called out to build with um, an incredible artist who has done something probably more artistically incredible that has to be done and takes a lifetime to do. But before I get into that, let me tell you, though, that this Power Right special just tuned in to the regular Power Right show, the only show on my element of hip hop. The writer, as I call it, of art on art and science on music. The only show in history on the hip hop writer element that I, a veteran of over 20 years, helped pioneer and create. So tune into that regularly on S Street Media. Then this special here, though, I couldn't continue with my special. I'm talking with a great author today um, without telling you about my book forthcoming, though. The ebook, I got an ebook coming soon called The Filtered Real Essays from the Invisible Renaissance. And um, taking the music mainly of 2018 and even backwards, um, detailing the this decade of music, its trends, its ideas with real creative works, real science on music and really put into a context of what I mean by when I call this decade of music the invisible renaissance. But I guessed, and what makes this a power right special is my guest is Chia Lee. Peace, peace. peace. Okay. And you know, when I first think of Chia Lee, I think of this quote from, um, there's a quote from the Dhammapada, it says this, the Dhammapada is an ancient Buddhist text and Sutra 21 says, he is without blame, though once he may have murdered his mother and his father, two kings, a kingdom, and all its subjects. Though the kings were holy and their subjects among the virtuous, yet he is blameless. The, father, the followers of the awakened awake, and day and night they watch. You know, that's a, a sutra called Out of the Forest. and It's ba mainly saying that it doesn't matter what you have done, it's how you deal with what you've done and how you come back to be righteous in some kind of way that you continue that war toward to some righteous path. You know what I mean? That's what Dhammapada means, the righteous path. You know, and when I started to read the book and the ideas uh, of your book, um, you know, this is what immediately came out. Just some background for the listener. Chi Ali, to me, out of all the young MCs, young rap acts, because there's a difference. There was definitely a difference back then. In the 90s, um, was really one of the few that not only was commercial, was really crossing over, but he actually had those technical gifts and skills. And we're going to talk about those because I can't do a, a Power Right Show special without talking about that science of music and the skill sets that were just Seemingly, when you read the book, just, hey, everybody knew for some reason. Maybe, maybe Yuchi was the one that didn't notice it immediately, you know? But um, from being a, a, a popular MC to going through strife in the streets as a drug dealer and all these twists and turns of hell in the streets, and then doing a massively, you know, a massive bid that changed his life and turned the corner, um, made, a, made a positive turn, though, and has become really a, a um, really a, a, I don't want to use the word role model and put pressure, but that's really you've penned your autobiography up to that moment when you're leaving jail um, called Another Kind of Freedom. You're here to bless us and, and we get to build on it. That's a fact. And um, let me tell you, I got this book and I only had two days to read it though. That's what's up. And what, I, what were your thoughts? And I you goddamn you did it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what's I put up. it down. And you know, one thing I like about reading a book like this in, in, in a very short time, it's kind of like I binge watched Chia Lee. You know what I'm saying? 
So I was immersed in the reality of Chiali. And I got to start first because this is what people don't really get out of these kind of things. And I always like to start the show. And a lot of the times when I interview guests, it's also an appreciation to the listener to show them the things that I saw that was next level that they may not notice when they go through it. And with this book, Another Kind of Freedom, the main thing that I noticed was you're not just telling your story, but you really are a gifted writer. Thank you. You know, there is. I a, didn't know that. So there, no, no. And, and I'll tell you why. I wouldn't have just said that. Um, it is very difficult to hold continuity with, with an audience, you know what I mean? And, and hold continuity and keep them guided into it. And also, when a life like yours, which is continuously hellish, the reader could sometimes lose focus. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh man, Chia Ali, when is he going to learn? When is he learn? You know, like those parts. But because. There's such a, and this is hard to do when you write an autobiography, you actually remembered all this stuff. You know, a lot of autobiographies, if, if people notice when you read them, writers will note that the author will note, like, I don't really know what else happened that night. And then they skip to another part because they didn't know. Yeah. So their autobiographies are kind of fragmented. This is detailed as hell. And even though it's a 254 page, if you really look at it, though, this really this book really runs near 400 if it was laid out with the common yeah. font, you know, yeah. that, that we're used to in, in other books. So it, it's detailed. It's, it's riveting. And um, the main thing that caught me about the writing style is that a lot of people have difficulty putting their normal speaking voice onto pen. That's why people love books like Catcher in the Rye and stuff, because Catcher, you know, that novel captured a regular kid's voice. Right. And even when you go back to the high school years, when you go back to when you were a kid, you still have that voice, you know what I mean? And it's just, there, there's so many, I, I probably want to read a whole bunch of segments, but I want people to read it themselves and get that. I don't just want to quote everything in yeah, it. Yeah, let them get it, let them, please, but, um, please. And that's why, that's why I want to mention certain things in the book and then just go through it, you know what I mean? But, you know, I got to start with, the music career and that part I was saying of Chi Ali. Because if any, you know, like a lot of the other child, I'm not even going to mention the names, but we know that some of the other child stars of your era, the, the rappers of your era, right? Because they were discovered more like a doo wop singer where they had a look and they said, hey, we like that look, put him into the booth and do this. When you would, the, when you tell your story about being discovered, you just were actually hanging out with these MCs and getting to know them. And they saw that, you know, you had something, maybe some kind of gift. And I'm still, I have to ask you for more, for more on it because it intrigued me. I've never heard a story like this where such a young brother is put on such the biggest stage. You know what I mean? And you didn't choke. You know what I'm saying? You. We keep seeing sports and we see following our athletes and, you know, they, great athletes choke. And you came up there in the Apollo that's the biggest stage. They they normally will boo you if it was whack. I'm saying I think I I I pay a lot of that too. I never thought about rapping. Like I never was a young kid. Like I'm mm. gonna be an MC. I think growing up, I was like the average kid. Like when I got home from school, we was watching videos, doing our homework. You know, mm -hmm. waiting for the rap videos on video, whatever Donnie Simpson was on and whatnot. You know, so I was just the average motherfucker that loved hip hop, and it just so happened at the time. A lot of the dope MCs came from, you know, the Bronx. From I was big on, you know, KRS One and Boogie Down Productions, mm -hmm. and just that whole Jungle Brothers movement. That that you know, the whole movement was just dope to me. So when I was introduced to Chris and Shaquem and Latif and all of them, it was I was young, and at the time they really wasn't popping yet. So it was a friendship based on, you know, I was just little chief from the hood, like mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I was just a little kid from the hood that you know just was around. And um, I think it was just, it, it just was real generic, you know what I mean? It just flowed fluently because mm -hmm. it wasn't forced enough and it just happened. Like one day when, when that shit happened at the Apollo, I was just there. Nobody knew I rap. I didn't know I rap. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just, right, right. I knew I had a poem from when I went to African manhood classes when I was like nine, 10 years old that mm -hmm. I told them niggas and they was like, you not going right, to be scared? Right, right. I was yeah, like, yeah. nah, I'm not going to be scared. But I was scared, of course. You know what I mean? I was scared as right, fuck. Right. But, um, you know, it went well. And from that, you know, shit just took off. But, um, you know, it was dope. It was, it was a dope time. And I think, you know, it's weird because it's like almost 25, 30 years later and a lot of motherfuckers still recognize. And, yo, Chia Lee, and I'll be like, yo, how do people like, even remember? 
mm-hmm. know. And I think I, I I pay that too. I think at the time it wasn't a, a bunch of MCs. It was a handful. Like at the, if you was young, it was myself, Chris Cross, and the youngsters. That was it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It was one of the three. You either rocked with one, two, or three, or everybody, but that was it. So it's easy to remember us. You right, know what I mean? Right. When I mean, it was a hand. It was KRS. It was Rakim. It was Kane. Those mm-hmm. was the top. You know what I mean? Then you had Chuck D and them. But for the main part, we remember all of that vividly. And I think I think that's a big difference from today because it's like a lot of artists, they got dope songs, and I don't even know what they look like, yo. Right, right. It's a saturation. Like, I don't even... Yeah. Do they still... Like you gotta go to you. You gotta go on the internet for video. Like BT and MTV, do they even show videos still? Yeah, I, yeah, very rarely. And they have separate know. channels now that throw you yeah, some R&B, shit is, shit is BT Soul. But you know, everything was generic. It happened like it was just meant to be. It just happened. Cause I swear to you, I never thought about rap. I used to mm-hmm. DJ. I used to. One Christmas, my pops bought me turntables. I used to go to the Wiz when Bay Plaza opened and buy records. Mm-hmm. I used to think I was a DJ. Really right, nice. right, right. I remember that in the book too, as but well. But it, it was just the culture. It was and, just the hip hop scene. With the emceeing, right? Because for every single, nearly every record that was released at that time, including yours, really most of the emcees, unless they were really on some crossover and it didn't really matter, they all had some kind of technical skill. And that's the thing about hearing the fabulous Chiali album is like there's no mess ups. Everything's in the pocket. You know what I mean? Everything is flowing. And when you were making this record, one thing I, I just wanted more elaboration on and stuff like that was like, when you were making this album, Beat Nuts produced most of it and stuff like that. And, you know, um, when you were making this record with the Beat Nuts as producers, because I got to build with them, but I never got to ask them about your record. You know, it was so much to talk to them about. Right. You know what I mean? And their own records that they wanted to talk about. Right. right? And as you come up and you're literally learning how to rhyme and stuff like that, what was some of the initial advice when they were doing? Did it take a lot of takes to get these songs down? Or were they- I mean, it definitely took a lot of takes. I mean, I was a kid. It wasn't much advice, honestly. It was just, that ain't it. That ain't it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, that right there. Do that again like that. That type thing. What type of track? Because there was the the variations of the track. The tempos were all variated, you know, varied. You know, um, even though today when people hear it, they don't get it because... Most of us have seen, heard those breaks used so many by everybody else again and again. It makes that seem used. Right. But a lot of the songs had different tempos. Was there a tempo that you felt like was harder than the others? Nah, I think for the most part, Chris, baby Chris, rest in peace. Chris, you know, I was a kid, yo. Chris picked most of the beats. Like, Chris would just give me a bunch of beats and be like, I guess he would pick beats he liked and be like, you pick what you like from those. And oh, so he gave you a pool of what he liked, and right. he went. Deep. I mean, I'm guessing that's what he. Did. He right. gave me okay. a pool of beats, so I'm guessing he listened first. Got and, you. Got you, you know, because like I said, I was young, so a lot of that first album, a lot of it was, mm-hmm. a lot of it was, you know, the, myself, the Beat Nuts, Black Sheep, just uh, uh, you know, a little gumbo of all of us effort for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, Daylight and Fire and Tribe, everybody right, contributed, right. but for the most part, Black Sheep yeah. and the Beat Nuts and, and myself. Exactly. And I just, you know, I have to say this to the listener, though, because posse cuts were always a thing. And one of the, the sleeper posse cuts of the 90s has to be the one that you did with everybody there. With Dang, the all cool. of them. That, that beat still it has a unique, fresh break on it. Like, it really, wasn't really used well, you that know, much. That's, it. you know, tribe. That's, yeah. that's that native tongue thing. You know, everybody loved De La, Fife, Rest in Peace. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was just a dope time. So it yeah. was a dope time for rap, for hip hop, for MCing. And it's. It's ill because I never would have thought like 25, 30 years later, a motherfucker still be eating from some shit we was just doing to do, mm-hmm. like not <laughs> thinking about it. Right, and right. it's like, wow, that shit is it's dope. It's pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. And you know, to me, it's really one of the necessary crates. You know, when you're digging in the crates and you say, oh, you got to have that that fabulous Chiali, you know what I mean? For sure. But when I, when we, you know, when the two things about that after the record is made that I was thinking about, like, Because this comes up a lot in the book, and I'm going to say this later, the whole retrospect thing. Right. Because I thought that was incredible. I've read a lot of autobiographies. I've never seen like it highlighted like that. We'll talk about it in a minute. But you were doing that through the whole book, and that's what makes the book so appealing because it has a sincerity to it. You know, you, you really go back and try to, you know, even though you admit a lot that you were an asshole, 
you really try not to be an asshole when you look back and do the knowledge and say, I mean, how did this go? I'm Especially a natural, with like with the asshole thing, like I'm a natural. It's not like I try. So a lot of shit, I'm not really right, right. trying to offend you. I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, being... And, and for, the, like, for, the re for the reader that's definitely going to get this book, um, there are parts where you really had a real nice comedic tone with it too, where you were saying something and you're like, see, I was an asshole. And I just thought that was funny though. So yeah, chialebx.com, go get that too, <laughs> y'all. Word, word. And, um, but one of the retrospective things, notes that I, I, I thought about, because as a journalist for all these years, since 94, I, I tried to judge the music on the music and not basically what the music did as far as commercially. Right. I want to judge the music on how dope it was and how sincere the, the MC was, whatnot, right? And since you put out everybody's thoughts on what those singles should have been in the direction, I just want to put my pitch in there that you read the book and stuff. I was with what you were saying. Yeah. You know, I wanted you to release the more you? rugged guy. I'm, I'm 43. I'm so, 43. Yeah. yeah. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We knew so what I was it like, was. That's you, why. You were saying, I got to put something for the street. They I was, was like, yeah. older and they mm -hmm. was thinking... You yeah. know, millions of dollars. Yeah, because we was thinking when I was watching, when I was watching AJ Number the Number, I was like, man, that's dope. But I, I wish he rhymed something like more hard. And Funky Lemonade was almost there. It's almost there. Sure but there were some nah. other cuts though. Yeah. That I, like the the intro and the first three cuts. Those it wasn't with that though. They was yeah, like, they and I was like, those would have been like perfect B sides at least though. Like like. See, you know? they was on some, you know, they was on the commercial thing. They was trying mm -hmm. to get money. They was trying to get money. Yeah, yeah. And my thing was, yeah, but y'all don't got to walk around this motherfucking <laughs> city. Like, right, you know what right, I mean? Like, yeah. I got to be running around the hood. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know. Yeah, happened. yeah. It was supposed to happen. Anyway, that was, I, I had to put my vote in there just so it's cataloged for posterity and I shit. Heard you. you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, you know, let's go, you know, let's go to, um, to another thing here, right? Um... And I'm going to jump around from things. I'm going to do this on purpose because I want to jump around from things that are in the book because I don't want to do talk about this book chron chronologically as you wrote it because I want the listener to get that feel and not uh, just uh, yeah. summarize the book and stuff because that would be whack and it's not going to be the same as reading it. You know what I mean? Heard you. But one of, the theme, oh, one of the themes that you come up a lot with is and you said it on, you know, page 207, so it's deep inside the book and stuff. And as the book goes along, though, it just has so much more insight as you go along. Like, the jewels just keep popping as you go along. And one thing that I saw in the book is that there's a part in the book, especially when you're really wilding out. You're going to VA, you're dealing with all these other women, you're losing track of everything. Like, you're losing track of the money, the women, all of that. And there's still something in there that is able to present all that and that's why when you speak about the humanity of the criminal like there's still a humanity in there we could just not look at it as like well we like chiali because you showed us some stuff that wasn't so good you know what i'm saying you showed us some parts in this book where we're like man that's that's pretty foul you know what i mean uh, he's really digging himself in a ditch here you know what i mean and i when you and you even talked about how it was difficult to write all these things like that, you know. And I wanted to go back to that beginning of writing this book. When did you start writing this book? When you were still in locked up? Yeah, I, I wrote it and completed it. While, I think that's how I started. I had about six months before my release, and just throughout my bed, everybody from Wahida Cloth to Terry Woods, different motherfuckers and mad individuals throughout the state, mm -hmm. was just like, "Yo, you got to tell your story." But I probably just was being lazy, like, man, I'm not writing no book. And then, I don't know, one day I was in Fishkill, and I just was like, I was in a two-man room, my little man Talib, and they used to be smoking weed. I was like, yo, get the fuck out. <laughs> and I started writing, yo. And he used to, after that, it I just was just- It just came, the, the spark I just, just came. was like, yo, I'm going to just start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it just started flowing, and then- once it started flowing, I was just more consumed. Was like, is it gonna be enough? Like, is it gonna be yeah. enough information for a book? Right, right. Like, that's what I was more concerned I've with. I've helped people write their autobiography and their ideas in that in that fashion. Did you, when you started, did you go, I'm gonna only think about the beginning and then go chronologically, or did you just let sometimes? When a story came to mind that was later, you just wrote that down just in case you might forget. No, I was trying to go chronologically, but if something popped up, I might. And do a cut. On a side like note, just, just write something that I'm, I know would 
bring my memory back to okay. know what I was talking about. Got you, got you. And figure out where it fit into the timeline. Got you, absolutely, absolutely. I definitely see that, you know what I mean? Um, now, this is a question that I had. This is just a generic question, but you know the part. I'm not going to say it because that was an adventure. That's one of the most interesting adventures in there. Um, and you know what I mean. Uh, when you were talking about Smiley, was that is that the same Smiley the Ghetto Child that was down with, with uh, a Gangstar Foundation? Absolutely. <laughs> I had to ask, though, because, you know, you Smile. didn't write a Smiley yeah. the Ghetto Child, you know what I mean? And... Um, <laughs> You know, it's funny um, because I got to build um, and interview Smiley the Ghetto Child for Classic Storm Radio, Peace to DJ Toshi, and uh, it was also with my man from Ohio, G Huff, right? Peace, G Huff. And um, that's my first time meeting Smiley. And when I was reading what you were saying about Smiley, I said, this has to be the same Smiley because that's smile. that's I never smile. saw... A character like that. Smiley's amazing. The, his his character was crazy He's dynamic. Still amazing, and, yo. I was with him like three yeah. weeks ago. Smiley's amazing. <laughs> Smiley be yeah. mid sentence. He just go woo. Yeah, he yeah. Just, he just go woo. Like, he's I think it, it was me. It was me. It was um, C. Ray's Walls had a release party last year, and he had Smiley the Ghetto Child do some songs as part as part of the bill, and Smiley the Ghetto Child did like a half hour set, and he did everything literally in like a straight kata like it was like in a horse stance like kung fu horse stance and he was punching all of the words like and it was 30 minutes like the yo, set was like 30 crazy, minutes crazy yo the Fluck energy rap. was just, that nigga's crazy yeah, smiley's was mind retarded, blowing yo. you know and like when we did our interview with him you know toshi was like because toshi's real quiet he let him out and you know we do the outro without him he says we don't need him for this so he could go and everything and we just hear Smiley playing his own song that he just came out and yelling about his own song in the dead of night in the street and telling just random homes about his song. It was just, I told you, I it's a character. God. It's a character. Yo, Pure hip hop. I swear to God, Smiley's <laughs> crazy. Yo. Pure hip hop, man. I was like, I knew it was that, that, that had to be that Smiley. There couldn't be another one in the Bronx like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, back to the actual title, you know, the title's unique, another kind of freedom. It insinuates that there were two types of freedom, you know, that you're referring to. What do you, when you wrote, when you thought of that title, what were you thinking? The title, honestly, the title is something I thought of more recently, and that's just a way, of, just a mental state of where I'm at right now. I mean, everybody is gonna, of course, correlate it to my physical freedom from the sentence. Mm -hmm. However, it got nothing to do with that, because when I was physically released from prison, I don't feel I was free yet. Like, I didn't have a grip on what it was yet, what I was doing, what it was yet. I still, you know, you go through a lot of shit while you're in there. I was still bitter, and I still am to this day bitter towards certain, you know, groups. I mean, sure, like, sure. I just, like, just a lot of government shit, like shit, most of the organizations, you know, with a flag on it is responsible for, you know, the black man's demise. Like, so... I feel a way. So when I say another kind of freedom, it's just more about the state of where I'm at now. Like, I'm able to do what I got to do and take care of what I got to take care of without, you know, having to really take part in, um, you know, uh, I guess everyday normal society. You know, I could talk to the kids and go into jails and right, get bread right. like that, doing shit like that. So for me, that's dope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I definitely see that. You know what I mean? And I saw this, and it's very subtle in there, but that war between... Um, you know, their system, their programs, their ideas, but then at the same time, and I just want to pose this as, a, as like just being totally trying to contradict you and put you on the spot there with that idea. Someone would say, looking at you, maybe a conservative person that doesn't understand, maybe they read the book and they still don't get it, right? They said, but, but Chi Ali, you, you, in prison, you use the programs that they themselves have. You know, you use their programs. So how could you be against what they were doing? You know, then that means, I mean, I wouldn't would that be a justification? No, nah, to people, system? it's a lot of people that feel like the college, especially Republicans, again, conservatives, they feel like the college program should not be in the prisons. They feel like if mm -hmm. I got to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to send my kids to school, why the fuck would a motherfucker that killed somebody get a free, right, get a right. free ride? And I get it. I get their viewpoint. But my point is this. 99% of the people in prison is coming home one day. And if they not learning nothing, they're going to be 
taking your purse and busting you upside your head again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if we want to eliminate that, we got to give them some knowledge, wisdom, and understand it. And at the end of the day, the money is going get, to get spent anyway. The money is being mm -hmm. spent anyway, whether it's... It's all type of silly shit the money is spent on in prison. So why not spend it to educate people? The program in Sing Sing, myself, my bro right there, we both mm -hmm. completed the program. Like It was at one point, I don't know if it's still current today, but at one point, everyone who graduated that program and went home, no one, it was 0% 0, 0 recidivism rate. So that meant no one came back. So that would mean that it's doing mm -hmm. something positive. So why wouldn't you implement that in more prisons rather than be reducing the, the mm -hmm. college programs in the prisons? So, you know, I just be on some other shit with it man it's just it's just this whole system is crazy funny still but you know we're here now absolutely yeah i definitely appreciate that you know what i mean and you know again it made me think of other places too that go against these systems and stuff like that you know um i know um for example fidel castro he always said that when you increase the knowledge of the people then their culture increases you know, and the gods, I mean, we always been saying that, you know? I mean, it, it, it could be something as little as a, a dispute about a rap record, a dispute about a box mm -hmm. or whatever. When two people dialogue, we could disagree, we could agree, whatever it is. But when we disagree and go back and forth, usually when it gets violent is when someone gets upset. And usually they get upset because they can't express themselves to the level of the other person. Mm -hmm. So they take it somewhere else. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why it's, it, it's important. This little things like that education and just learning how to express yourself and talk and write like it's just it's taken for granted because we think it's common knowledge but in when you were in prison i swear to god i didn't realize it was so many motherfuckers that didn't have like d geds and diploma like mm -hmm. that shit was amazing i was like so many people got to go to height like gd class it's like mm -hmm. what the fuck is going on right. and mad and motherfuckers can't read and you started to see these trends and then it became a thing right Where yeah you i mean these trends. like when you hear about the um illiteracy rate I think a lot of that is the motherfuckers in prison, yo. Like, it got to be, because most of the people I know on the streets, like, little kids can read. But it's like, where's these kids sliding through the cracks that just don't learn that skill? Mm -hmm. That shit is just bugged out. Absolutely. I definitely appreciate that you're saying that. And it's well spoken for in, in the book as well, you know? But let me throw some ideas at you that you, you were throwing. In the, um, in the very beginning of the book, right, um... You said, you said also that justice has to come from within, you know? And then later in the book, you said... Um, <laughs> I feel that way, for right? sure. Yeah, and you said if you're, that if your prayers were answered, at that moment when you were about to, you know, you didn't know what you, how long the bid was going to be, the case wasn't decided yet, you said if your prayers were answered and you beat the case, you would become more arrogant and more destructive. You know what I mean? Definitely. And, I think so, definitely. And the, and the thing is this, like throughout this prison experience right and you say when justice comes from within what it, what does that mean to you what would that mean it means to me this like i remember the uh what's the boy name that got killed in the bronx the the, the dominican nigga stabbed him up well times junior i remember that incident right yo that shit was a fucked up incident they got everybody that did it so my thing is this, if you want justice, according to y'all, justice is them going to jail. So if justice is served once they get sentenced, if that's justice to you, then I hate that's justice. But some of them and everybody like, oh, that's going to happen to them in jail. They're going to get just man. Some of them niggas might live better than they live out here. Some of them might get dealt with in jail. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But trust me. All of them ain't soft. What did they did to Shorty? I know that. Like <laughs> some of them is gonna be all right, <laughs> you know. And that's the reality of it. And you know, right. so it's like, is that justice? Like for me, that's not justice. Mm -hmm. Like I took a man's life. I did twelve years. So I feel like at this point, society, I did. I, they got their justice according to society. That's really justice, though. Mm -hmm. Like for the victim's family, how could that be justice? I'm out here. I'm living like a king. How could that be justice? Like, real talk, we talking about me, but how could that right, be justice right. for them? You know so what I mean? So what do you say is justice then? Like, what? What's I'm saying it, it got to come from within. I can't tell you how to feel if I take your son. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what justice is. Some people really do believe in forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So for them, that might be justice. For, you know, for some prison, it might be justice. I don't know. Mm -hmm. For me, I know I did jail. My man, we did jail. That shit was all boys camp. If that's justice for you, I, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That shit was just a waste of time for us. 
Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't see the correlation. But you know, everybody think prison is justice. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's a question that you know is not even just from this society, but has been discussed in societies throughout time. Though, do we build prison mm-hmm. houses to imprison? You know what I mean, right? The um. There's also, you know, along with that idea, though, there's also the idea that the black man, the original man, is often presumed guilty. And that was an interesting thing that you had of the commentary about the America's Most Wanted, because that whole show, technically, the people in the show weren't found guilty. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're and not they even might give you, yet. Right. They might give you a disclaimer. But everything that they were showing was really but that shit is the, just the bias, the the, mm-hmm. the people in the world's right. opinion. That, oh, this motherfucker's crazy. He killed somebody over to. Oh man, if I see him, I'm calling. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? That shit is just the bias, the people's opinion, man. You don't have, you wasn't there. Mm-hmm. How the fuck you know all of this? <laughs> and the, the nigga dead. And you wasn't there. How you know? That's why the whole system is funny. The DA and your lawyer, neither one of them was there. Yet they telling the story. <laughs> they telling the story. You sitting right here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That shit is crazy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it is what it is, man. Right, absolutely. You know, I related a lot to the end when, you know, you were asked to teach and help teach certain classes and stuff like that. Um this is part of my history in the community. Uh, once I got knowledge of self, teaching at a lot of school, having a class that deals with the youth coming in voluntarily. and See, that's justice. That's I, justice. I see that. I see you that. You see what I'm saying? Because right. it's like, I, I ain't turned myself in. I ran. Y'all caught me. Y'all sentenced me to 14 years. Cool. That was the law, the state, mm-hmm. people getting their justice. For me... Like, at the end of the day, I killed a black man. Mm-hmm. I killed my daughter's uncle, my baby mother's brother. At the end of the day, like, I feel like I got to do something. So when I'm at a school or when I'm going to jail, that's me doing something. That's mm-hmm. not, that's nobody's true. mandating me to that. Right, right. You know what I mean? And that's justice. Mm. You know what I mean? That, so that, du- that duty of being civilized yeah, now. Right? A fact, that's a fact. Understood, understood. And, you know, what, you know, what was interesting is that there's always this difficulty, and this is a difficulty you talk about throughout. And, you know, and for example, where you talk about jail friends versus real friends, this idea of changing the, the, the scope of our people's thinking of what our relationships, what our morals and ethics, and how we relate to each other, you know what I mean? And there's very few, they're very, you know, disposable, you know? And a lot of times when we start teaching the youth, if they come with certain levels of savagery, certain wrong ways, certain things like that, it's hard to turn them away from that, especially if they continue to be alive with those methods. You know what I mean? That's a fact. And since you've, since you've gone out, what are some of the things that you've learned in dealing with the youth as far as, like, you know, interacting with them and, and dealing with them, you know? Like, <laughs> it's work. We got work to do. Like, <laughs> we got some work to do. Like, they don't have a clue. They clueless, but... I guess at one point I was right there, so I can't, you know, you can't be too hard on them, but it's like when we go to Rikers Island, we, me and my son, we go to Rikers Island, we be in the, in the bin, you know, in OVCC, and, um, you know, so everybody, you know, we, it, it, was, it, it, it was warm, so we outside with the brothers that's in the bin, where they in their little rec pen, okay. and it's like, yo, the level of not just ignorance, but just being lost is at an all-time high, I mean, you got kids like, yeah, son, I, yeah, we was getting it popping with police yesterday. Ah, ah, ah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, bruh, they trying to give you 30 to life. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, you focus on all the wrong things right now, and it's not going to hit him until he got about nine, ten years in. Right, and he right. realized, God damn, like, I'm not halfway done yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm just, you know, trying to let them know and trying to, Trying to trying to give back like that, like if I could help a motherfucker from walking that path, that you know, that have to hurdle that obstacle that I had to hurdle, right, right. or even being on the other end, cause you know, either way, either way, and um, it's ill, cause like with the whole Nipsey shit, and um, everybody with the dude that allegedly killed him, mm-hmm. it's like yo, but everybody family that lose a loved one feel like that. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, we going crazy on homie because it was nip. I get it. But who lose a loved one and don't feel the same way about the person that did that? You know what right. I'm saying? But right. it's not an outcry like that. You know what I'm saying? And I got to feel that way because I was the motherfucker on the other side. But at the end of the day, it's everybody lost. We just as dead as the motherfucker we killing. Mm -hmm. Especially at that time. You know what I'm saying? And I get... You know, you still get a lot of negativity, like, on social media and shit. Like, oh, he's a killer, he this and that. And I'm like, yo, all right, I did that. I was fucking 21, and I made a mistake. Mine might have been a little more blatant than some of yours, and I got caught for it. But at the end of the day, what you want me to do? Go kill myself? If, I, if you don't want me to kill myself, I got to keep living. And that means I got to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to keep it pushing. My condolences. I did my time. The family was cool with the time. It's over now. It's time to move on. And that's where we at with it, you know? Right, understood, definitely. You know, I like it, though, and just the thought that I had in my head, though, is that a lot of times students ask me how I was able to do certain things, right? And you talked about decisions and stuff. And I think when I read your story, I felt like I was on that spectrum, but I listened to the lessons of elders before, before trying them. Right. So if they showed me the failures, and I guess people that I was with showed me those failures really well, so I didn't have to step into them. Even right. though it, it takes discipline because right. you have to do without some things. You don't, don't right. get to be as fly. don't get to be do all yeah, these things. I was hard -headed. But there's a little bit. Right, right. I was hard And the, the thing that your father kept telling you about keep the gun at the house, that way you have retrospective. You could think about things and deal with that emotion. It's almost like he was throwing you those small jewels of, of what I call having that chess mind. You know, because you can't play chess without thinking, like, what they might do if you do this. If I move this piece, what would they do to this piece or my other pieces? Face, you, you know? <laughs> and if you can't, if you could think like that in real life, then you would say, ah. Oh. But now you know? that I'm home from prison, like, I can think like that. Because you, like, when you be dealing with parole and shit like that, you got to, because you got to think for other motherfuckers. Because mm -hmm. some motherfuckers is retarded. <laughs> and they just never been through it. So that's the last thing on their mind. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But they don't realize how easy it is. And when the shit happens, you going to be, you, mm -hmm. let's go. So right. you got, we got to be cognizant. And mm -hmm. I always, I'm thinking for other motherfuckers. Motherfuckers think I'm crazy, right. yo. My friends think I'm crazy, yo. Like they think I'm literally crazy, yo. Even in what you were saying, you were saying when you got your degree, you said that positive people care about tomorrow. While the average person that is not the negative only think about today. But I was also thinking Because if that, you ain't got nothing, what the right. fuck? Shit. And I was fuck also thinking that nigga, tomorrow even, gonna be fucked up like today. Right. Shit. Right. Damn, yeah. Man, fuck that. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Even in your like your thoughts about different spiritualities and things like that, right? Even the majority of spirituality, especially Christianity, also remind the person that this is all you have is today too. You're not promised tomorrow. That's a common thing told to us if we deal with religions. So it's hard to get into our people's mindset that, yo, like, if you do make it past the day, these will have repercussions tomorrow. Like, there is a connective tissue in, the, in all this. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's difficult. You know what I mean? Sometimes we have to end up showing our stories and stuff. So I want to continue in this other thing, in this vein, because I want to spend a lot of this interview on your thoughts and ideas, but also what you're doing after this great story, though, doesn't really need much detail. It's so well written and so detailed. Thank you, bro. It isn't redundant. You know like, I mean? yo, that shit means a lot, bro, because I swear to God, yeah. when I was writing it, I don't, I ain't know how people was yeah, going to yeah. take it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a hard life, and it doesn't seem redundant. You know what I'm saying? And I think, like, the parts that are repetitive, like, with, like you know, because you just kept dealing with all these women. You just kept dealing with the dealing. At the same time, though, I, I felt, this is my perspective on it, I felt it led up to the shooting to the inevitable you know what i mean to the inevitable because right because there were so many mistakes being made and decisions that were overwhelming and now you made a slap and it was i thought it was very telling that it 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 was in a weakened state that you ended up doing this because you were very sick yeah. and you, you ended up reacting like that and it was just very telling how a lot of times we make our worst mistakes when we're angry or weakened or you know what I mean? Because we have to summon extra like energy. Right into some shit I didn't even think about. I was in a weak state. Yeah. Mm. You know? And look, we're, we do want to deal with that knowledge, though. How we make devil? We make devil by making him weak and wicked. So he's not wicked. He has to be weakened. Then he commits the act that is wicked. Mm. Right? Because nobody's a devil unless they do a wicked act. 
But if they're in the wicked state, they're more likely to do something wicked, you know? Mm, that's a jewel so, you could use if you choose. <laughs> yeah, so I thought it was just really telling. But I would say this to, to, to you, to all the listeners, and to a thought I had in my mind. I think that you are a writer. I'll say that now. And in five, in five years, because I want it faster than ten I would love to see a book, not just a, a another autobiography or like, you know, like an addendum, like you continue the autobiography, but actually like essays about your ideas, how they that work in real life. It will never be another autobiography, you know I mean? like a part right, two. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, but because the things that's that, not happening. the things that, but I would definitely the things that you my and my son are doing, like the, the, the Kings Killing Kings March is going to go down tomorrow. Yeah. And everybody come doing, through Newark, New Jersey, brings, three o'clock. I wanted to ask you that to conclude because I did a lot of mar mar the first marches I was ever in was for Diallo. You know what I mean? I'm gonna do. And 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 it was out in the Bronx because Wheeler I, Ave, right? Um, Elder or Wheeler? Uh, Evergreen? It was on Evergreen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, for like ten years, police stayed on that block after that. Yeah, that shit is ill. And the thing is, right? Over the years, one thing that I see that you and my son are able to do, and it really is the magnetic and the works that you have. These, these, this life is now works because it means something now in what you say. And the works that you and my son have, it gives a different perspective to marches that people weren't really dealing with. Most people look at marches like, yeah, we're not going to ask the white man for anything. But every time I hear you speak about it and my son, it has more of a unity aspect. Like we're not doing this to ask you people for things. We're not, we're not only demanding things, but we're doing this to develop a camaraderie with the community. For sure. You know what I mean? And that, that's something that I haven't seen in marches in a long time. I'm saying you know? if you're not, you know, Mice is moving around a lot, but I'm, I'm on the ground with it. Like when I'm in New York, I'm mm -hmm. on the ground with it. And I, that's where the people is at. That's where you get the, 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 the temperature of what's going on. And when this shit going on, he there, like shit in the Bronx, like we there like real shit going mm -hmm. on we there shit there's lives at risk but if we got to make sure shit is deaded and i mean it just is what it is like yo that's what we doing that's what we pushing Absolutely. right now that's real peace that's real peace you know and um as a final question since this is the power right special here um the, the, say it again the power right special i thought you were saying the pyrex oh no no the power right yeah yeah, power, power right for the listeners. The power right was the name that Bones Malone gave me when he saw my writing, but it's because I was with in the picture with Power Rule. Right. Remember Prince Power Rule? So I was in the picture with Prince Power. So it's Power Rule and Power Right. But talking about the music, when you came out, the few songs that you did, they had even more, more, um, more sincerity in them. They had more impact in them because of the things that you lived. You know what I mean? And um and I definitely like the the interplay that you have when you rhyme with my son. You know right. what I mean? There's definitely like an interplay with there. You know, so just of what you're leading to, are you leading to make more albums or are you just like letting I'm saying, your song? Mice, mice, mice and I may do a little E P. We got like two or three songs done. Okay. We just between <clears throat> his schedule, my schedule, and just, you know, living life. Right, right. Um, but we're gonna make it happen. Mice yeah. Mice is a lot more into the music than me. Right. However, I'm, if we're gonna do it, I kind of probably gotta make it happen. I gotta write really do all right. Well, do it all like, like I work. did before, though. I put my vote for that because I would love Thank to hear you, the bro. records that you make because I felt like with the records that you had throughout this decade, like it's just a little like I want you to shoot more so that way we get even it gets even more refined because there, there's more there to me. Because what I read here, it's always a good tell that a uh, uh, such a well written book would give us an even more well written MC, you know. Thank so you. I mean I with the music really, for me you know, more than mice, I just be like, yo, if it gotta just make more financial sense. And I feel like a right. lot of uh, and, and I hear a, that a lot, lot of yeah. other endeavors bring us more bread. Absolutely, where the Understood. music we yeah, spend yeah. more bread. That's why I was so. asking if you go into That's albums right. or just letting those songs come as they you know fluidly hit you and as they come creatively. Honestly, when you know? we do a song, mice would just call me like, "Yo, Chi, you got to get on this song with me," or I will call mice <laughs> right, like, "Yo, I got this beat, we got to do a joint to it, and we'll do it." Other than mm -hmm. that, how it happens, straight up and down. That's right. Well, Chi Ali, with our time is up here. Before we get next the next part of this special, this S Street Media special with Chi Ali, my brother. I want to thank you, Chi Ali. It's thank an you for honor. Me, you know what I mean? Um, 
there's not a lot of builders that take their experience though. They usually take their experience and insight and run away. You know what I mean? To go back and sincerely give certain things is a blessing to all of us though. You know what I mean? And I mean, um but yo, and it's a blessing that I'm able to like that the people oh, who fact. Take Yeah, yeah. Out. Actual fact. Actual like fact. Like I said, like I said, you know, to me that's the old one I did is the ultimate cuz you mm -hmm. can't you can't take that one back. You Absolutely. Know? So the book is called Another Kind of Freedom. ChiAliBX.com right. or Amazon. But that's go to right. ChiAliBX.com. We get all that bread. That's right. That's right. More direct, you know what I mean? And with that said, on to the next show. And remember, the Power Right Show, just like this Power Right special, is a never respect fake broadcast. My name is Sunya Zala, aka Skillustrator Low. Chi Ali, peace, BX boy. It ain't Pyrex, nigga. <laughs> Word. <laughs> peace. Yeah. Flow cheesy, I got you, baby. Set it off like this. <laughs> uh, the verse is like wrong. Locked down like hop on the arm. Uh. Two meanings at once, you know the rep And not a dance to it, so you couldn't know the steps <laughs> And that's two more meanings at once I tuck four in the fall like I'm beefing this up Throwing roids in the rack, boiling the batch The tour turns into dope boys in the trap Leaning off the love, how the noise will react And tell the pen lovers the employment is back <laughs> Back to it like today was the third Saran rap to it, high tape of the words Call me Riddle Man, phone jumping like I'm the middle man Hand work with the lines until a finger jam Hit the man like it's test the season When I tell you I can stretch, believe it okay. I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is all your crack, you inject me for your pain I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is all your crack, you inject me for your pain Murder, murder, lyrical assert up Cook the competition up like a fucking burger The disturber, I ain't never heard ya Rats more softer than a little can of Gerba Baby food, I pay dues and then some I learn how to turn this music into income You win some, you lose some, but that's how I go If you wanna get the bread, you gotta jump on the phone Do the show, get the dough, then you go That's how I was told by my OGs That's how they showed me 40 ounces of OE Puffin' on blunts, fucking with stunts Coolin' like Mo D I've been a grinder since I can remember Timberland boots, born text in the winter Never been a fighter, I'm a rhyme inventor You good, tell them focus, sent ya uh, I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is audio crack, you inject me for your pain I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is audio crack, you inject me for your pain Hey, on the audio crack, man Sell it to the black man I got that dope shit Call me Mrs. Smith Man. I let it burn right up and down a turnpike Give me a bull dagger, watch how I turn dice Lights, cameras, action, Oscars, Italian Pastas, weed, rosters, whatever you believe in Do it till you stop breathing Till they kill me, I ain't gon' stop eating Why would I? Good fella, good guy, hood fly Nigga keep the whole hood high G-spot, he hot, Nike's no Reeboks Acapella, yo, beat Eve in the beatbox Used to put the T-top, 300Z Rolling on B's, now I'm rolling on E's 2018, we don't ever drive over Cause your boy blow money like it grow on trees I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is audio crack, you inject me for your pain I've been winning without paying attention to the game Hustling, grinding, doing my own thing Flipping this music like bricks of cocaine This is audio crack, you inject me for your pain